Hi, I'm Dr. Olga Pinkston, a board-certified rheumatologist and the host of the Mind Your Fiber podcast. This podcast is dedicated to fibromyalgia. I discuss up-to-date information about fibro, its treatment, the biology and psychology of the fibromyalgia. I cover the pain science education, the complementary and alternative methods available to you now to improve your symptoms. There are a lot of things that influence development of fibromyalgia, trigger fiber flares, and produce other symptoms like IBS or irritable bowel syndrome, depression, and anxiety, and none of them are your fault. In the Mind Your Fiber podcast, you will learn how and why fiber develops, how chronic pain changes your brain, and most importantly, that you're not alone in the struggle, that fiber is real, and how to not let fiber control your life. This podcast provides information only and does not provide any medical or psychological services or advice. Well, welcome back to episode 24 of Mind Your Fiber podcast. Now, I know it's been a couple of weeks since my last episode. Apparently, the summer school break for kids and full-time job are not very conducive to podcasting. I'm still trying to figure out how I can batch produce content and deliver it more timely. Today, we continue talking about nutrition. I know I have several episodes dedicated to nutrition because nutrition plays an important role in managing fibromyalgia symptoms, and many of my fibromyalgia patients in the clinic, as well as on social media, often ask me about nutrition and how they can improve it. I had several episodes that cover the foundational knowledge of nutrition, such as what micronutrients, what are micronutrients or vitamins, the importance of approaching eating from not a diet mentality, reducing perfectionism, etc. Today is the next episode, and we're talking about microbiome. Now, I just finished teaching the course on mindful eating for autoimmune conditions, fibromyalgia, and chronic pain. Now, today's episode are the few slides I pulled out from several modules I taught on microbiome. I put together a general overview of the microbiome and what it is and how you can improve uh, your gut health. So I'm recording it not only as an audio podcast, but also uh, you can view it on YouTube uh, as a video. So if you want to look at the slides, uh, you're welcome to go to YouTube channel uh, with the, you can find the link in the show notes. Now, if you're interested in this course, you can sign up for the wait list on my website. I, I'll also put the link in the show notes. It's not yet ready for enrollment as of June 2022, but you can put your name on a wait list and I will send information as soon as I start enrollment. As always, if you have any questions about nutrition, pharmacology, or any additional topics you want to discuss, please feel free to email me and I will try to incorporate them in the future episodes. Thank you for listening. So again, why nutrition is so important? Good nutrition means eating a balanced and healthy diet. It is important to make sure that you're getting the nutrients, vitamins, and minerals your body needs to function properly. The gastrointestinal tract is complex. It has many organs. It starts in the mouth, then goes down to throat, esophagus, stomach, down to small intestine, large intestine, rectum, and anus. It also has a few accessory organs like liver, gallbladder, and pancreas. There are three main functions of the GI tract, transportation, digestion, and absorption of food. First, the food is ingested, chewed, and swallowed. Then the muscles of the gut or the tube that starts in the throat and goes down through the intestines, propels the food through elementary canal and physically break it down into tiny particles. In the GI tract, the nutrients and water from the foods are absorbed to help keep your body healthy. Whatever is not absorbed keeps moving through the GI tract until you get rid of it as stool. There's another part of the GI tract, the nervous system, or the enteric nervous system, comprised of 100 million nerve cells. It is the largest collection of nerve cells. This is what we call the second brain. The first brain is your head brain, 
uh, has direct effect on the stomach and intestines, the second brain, because they're tightly connected via the nervous system. The GI tract is sensitive to emotions and pain. The pain and feelings like anger, anxiety, sadness, happiness, all these feelings and many others and pain can trigger symptoms in the gut. Gut nerves need to be treated like an essential part of the GI tract, like an organ that needs care. There's another organ comp comprised of trillions of microbes that reside inside your gut called gut microbiome and affect the immune system, metabolism, GI disorders, brain disorders, behaviors, etc. So you also have to think of the microbiome as a part of the GI tract, like an organ that needs care. So just to review, the GI tract has many organs, but it also has the nerves of the nervous system and the microbiome, and they have to function well together. These are the common terms that you may hear uh, in the literature or on television. So the microbiome is a collective genomes of the microbes that reside in a particular environment. You may think of that as a physical characteristic of a person or microbe. The organism's genetic material is the genome. So microbes are like humans that populate the earth. And microbiome is like the entire population of humans on earth. Each human has its own unique genome or DNA. So is the microbes in the gut. Microbiota are the community of microorganisms themselves, like villages of human. They reside in different sections of the gut and have different functions and different characteristics. Microbiota diversity is a measure of how many different species res reside in that community. Like human diversity, how many different cultures and races are present. You won't have a high diversity of organisms in the gut because the lower diversity is considered a marker of dysbiosis or microbial imbalance in the gut and has been found in many conditions that are affecting health, like autoimmune diseases, obesity, cardiometabolic conditions like diabetes, heart disease, as well as seen in elderly. Again, gut microbiome differ along, along the GI tract. We have different microbes that reside in the mouth, in the esophagus, in the stomach, in the small intestines, large intestine, and, and anus. In a healthy person, these microbes coexist peacefully with the largest numbers found in the small and large intestine, but also throughout the body. Your skin is also covered in microbes, so are your lungs. Many things affect the diversity and health of the microbes. First, we get the microbes during the birth. And the actual experience of birth produces a different microbiome of the infant. If the baby was born through vaginal birth, it will have different and more diverse microbes than a baby born through the C-section. Also, breastfeeding versus formula feeding will produce different microbiome. The baby who is breastfed has contact of the skin, of the nipple, as well as different microbes that actually populate the breast milk. Formula is usually heated and more sterile, so the baby does not get as many microbes through formula. Also, location uh, where we reside plays play a big role. If somebody lives on a farm with exposure to animals, dirt, manure, uh, hay, and other plants, we'll have a different population of microbes than somebody who lives in an industrial city. Also, geographic locations produce different variety of microbes, uh, due to physical location, as well as different exposures to plants, rivers, uh, etc., and culture. Many cultures consume different foods, and those foods will have a different uh, probiotics or, or microbes that will populate the gut. Aging plays a role on the diversity and health of the microbiome. When the baby is crawling and touching things and puts things in, in the mouth, the baby is actually diversifying the microbes in their gut. As the child grows and gets exposed to a variety of different foods and vegetables, and uh, the, the microbes also uh, become more diverse. As the person grows and gets exposed to toxins or medications, or stress, it will also affect the health and diversity of microbiome. We also know that elderly will have less variety, sometimes because of eating 
or because of influences of medications or lifestyle choices. Also, exposures play a role. How much you travel, how much you played in, in the dirt as a child, how many pets you have, and do you wash your hands after touching pets play a role uh, in the microbiome diversity and health. Other things that influence the health of microbiome are stress. Stress has a negative effect on microbiome diversity as well as function. Many medications affect microbiome, especially antibiotics, uh, hand sanitizers, and other sanitizing agents. But the, one of the biggest influences on the health and diversity of microbiome is our diet. A diet can have a positive and negative effect on the health of microbiome. The microbiome needs a lot of vegetables to produce the variety um, of healthy microbes. So if the diet is lacking vegetables and, and water and has many processed foods and sugars, the microbiome will be not as healthy and not as diverse. So microbiome consists of microbes that are both helpful and potentially harmful. Most are beneficial and live in symbiotic relationship, meaning the human body and the microbes benefit from living together. Some, in small numbers, microbes are pathogenic, uh, meaning they can promote disease. Uh, but in a healthy body, pathogenic and beneficial microbes coexist without problems. If there's disturbance in that balance brought on by infection, diet, or prolonged use of antibiotics or other bacteria-destroying medications, dysbiosis occurs, and it will stop normal interactions between good and bad bacteria. As a result, the body may become more susceptible to diseases, and the gut-brain connection will malfunction. There are many benefits of microbiome. Microbiome stimulates the immune system. It also breaks down potentially toxic food compounds. It produces certain vitamins and amino acids, including B vitamins and vitamin K. Sugars like table sugar and lactose from milk are quickly absorbed in the upper part of the small intestine. They require little digestion. But the more complex carbohydrates like starches and fibers, plant food, are not easily digested and need to travel from lower to large intestine where the microbiota help break down these compounds. Fermentation is the chemical breakdown of substance by bacteria, yeast, or other microorganisms, typically involving bubbles or fizz, and give off heat. The fermentation of indigestible fibers causes the production of certain fatty acids called short-chain fatty acids. These fatty acids are special because we humans cannot make them. They can only be made by microbes. These fatty acids are used not only for nutrition, but also play an important role in muscle function, prevention of chronic diseases, including cancers and bowel disorders. Studies show that these short-chain fatty acids may be useful in the treatment of ulcerative colitis, Crohn's disease, and antibiotic-associated diarrhea. Butyrate, a short-chain fatty acid produced during the fermentation of dietary fiber from plant foods, may suppress colon cancer growth. The microbiome of a healthy person will also provide protection from, from ill-causing organisms that enter our body through drinking our food. For example, gut microbes order specialized immune cells to produce potent antiviral proteins that ultimately eliminate viral infections. In the body of the person lacking this beneficial gut bacteria, will not have a strong of immune response to invading viruses. So maybe this is why some people who have poor nutrition, who are obese and, or have diabetes, have more serious and complicated COVID-19 infections. Also, gut, gut microbiota plays an important role in the bidirectional communication between the gut and the central nervous system, the brain. The microbes can influence the brain function via the immune cells, hormones, and nerve cells. Also, gut produces 90% of neurotransmitters, serotonin, dopamine, glutamate, and GABA, chemical messengers that let nerves communicate with each other and keep brain functioning it also can affect the mood. So dysbiosis is also called dysbacteriosis, is a condition when the gut bacteria becomes out of balance or imbalanced. To have a healthy microbe, you should have protective and harmful microbes. This balance keeps your gut working properly. The right amount of bacteria in, the, in your gut flora helps regulate bacteria. 
kind of self-governing body. The good bacteria and the bad bacteria keep each other aligned. Changes to your gut microbiome may occur because the different organisms in your gut are not at the right levels or right amounts. When your gut microbiome loses the diversity of bacteria, it can increase your risk of getting chronic disease or chronic infection. All it takes is two hours worth of psychological stress to completely change the bacteria in your gut. So why do we have so many issues with microbiome? It starts at birth when the baby is born through via C-section versus vaginal birth. Then the baby is fed formula instead of breast milk. Also, we see increased consumption of processed foods that negatively affect the diversity and health of the microbiome. Then we also use antibiotics or other medications that suppress the growth and diversity of the microbiome. Clean environment, antibacterial products, living outside of exposure to nature, animals or dirt, also consuming irradiated foods that were sterilized or bleached, disinfected or microwaved. So there are many reasons why we have in our society issues with health of the gut or the microbiome. So there are three types of dysbiosis. In most cases, you may have all three occurring at the same time. It's not uncommon. So the first one is loss of good bacteria from your gut. Something killed the good bacteria, like an, an antibiotic, uh, or you didn't consume food that promotes the growth of good bacteria. Then there's going to be too much growth of harmful bacteria. If there is an imbalance between good and bad bacteria, the harmful bacteria may outgrow the amounts and there's no good bacteria to suppress it. Third is loss of overall microbiome diversity. It means you lose the good and the bad bacteria in your gut. Uh, you, you don't have as many different uh, microorganisms, so the, some functions may be missing. Americans have about a third less of my microbiome diversity than an average person living in undeveloped country. So when your gut health gets imbalanced and dysbiosis happens, you're more likely to have GI and other health conditions. This will include IBD or inflammatory bowel disease, Crohn's or colitis, uh, IBS or irritable bowel syndrome, diabetes, obesity, cancer, cardiovascular problems, central nervous system disorders, and infections. Also, there may be many symptoms due to dysbiosis, such as chronic fatigue, issues with digestion, trouble urinating, acid reflux or heartburn, vaginal rectal infections or itching, food intolerances, gas and bloating, uh, inflammation and achy joints, acne, skin rashes, and psoriasis, ADHD, and issues with concentration, anxiety, and depression. As you can see, some of the symptoms that, that we see in fibromyalgia may be due to the symptoms from dysbiosis. Another important condition we hear about more in the news is leaky gut syndrome. Leaky gut is a condition in which gaps between the tight junctions of the of the epithelial cells in the gut are impaired and allow pathogens to leak through the intestinal walls and pass directly into the bloodstream. We have cells in our gut called enterocyte epithelial cells that produce a gut blood barrier. So they play an essential role in digestion as well as absorption of nutrients. They are lined with villi, these little projections that increase absorption. Those villi Villi also uh, gives surface for uh, good bacteria to live there have, and have many uh, sensory and immunologic functions. We also have goblet cells that produce mucus that is essential to cover those villi and produce a barrier. And as you can tell, the cells are tightly connected to each other via the tight junctions. In liquid gut, these tight junctions are impaired uh, the cells are not so tightly bound together. They have room for the microbes and toxins to leak through uh, into the bloodstream. So our body tries very hard to maintain this barrier between the inside of the intestines and the bloodstream. It helps with nutrition as well as immunity. These cells help us absorb the good stuff and keep the bad stuff out inside the gut and to remove it with stool. 
The stirred function of the gut barrier is observed in many conditions, including Crohn's, osteoarthritis, colitis, you know, other inflammatory bowel condi conditions, as well as IBS, type 1 diabetes, and celiac and other food insensitivities and intolerances. Why are we talking about leaky gut syndrome? Because we can actually repair and prevent damage to the intestines by consuming fiber. Dietary fiber from plant foods not only feed the bacteria, it also produces the short-chain fatty acids like butyrate, which make the tight junctions stronger and reduce inflammation. There's also compounds called polyphenols that are, that are antioxidants that are found in a variety of plants. Many polyphenols are poorly absorbed from the diet, but they are produced by metabolism of microbiomes. So polyphenols are bioactive compounds that regulate inflammation, a gut microbiome, and intestinal barrier function. Also, studies show that exercise is important for leaky gut uh, prevention. People who exercise have healthier long-term markers of intestinal permeability at rest, meaning they have tighter junctions and less leakage in the gut. The main goals of the microbe-friendly diet changes are to improve the diversity of bacteria within your microbiota and to increase production of the short-chain fatty acids through fermentation by microbes, which is a byproduct of their digestion. Microbiota diversity can be encouraged by creating an environment in your gut that welcomes and sustains many different types of bacteria. Microbiota is very responsive to dietary changes and stress, thus changing foods can very effectively improve the health of your microbes or worsen depending on what you eat and how you manage your stress. Short-term dietary changes rapidly influence the health of, of microbiome for better or for worse. Rapid shifts create rapid changes. Long-term diet is the goal to achieve and maintain health and diversity of your microbiome. What you eat will either nurture microbes or not. So your food choices long-term will translate into positive health effects of healthy microbiome or will produce ill effects on your overall health. So here are the common terms we use when we talk about microbiota and microbiome. Probiotics and prebiotics. Probiotics are the food or supplements with live bacteria or microbes. They replenish or add to your existing microbial diversity. Prebiotics are what microbes eat. These substances come from types of carbs, mostly fiber, that humans cannot digest. This is bacterial food. The beneficial bacteria in your gut will eat that fiber. And the byproduct of their digestion are the healthy substances that we humans need. We need both. We need bacterial diversity, and we need to keep it by feeding it well. So what microbes eat? Microbes need food that are called MAX, or Microbiota Accessible Carbohydrates. These are carbohydrates that are resistant to digestion by humans, and they are made available for gut microbes. These MAX are also called prebiotics. They will ferment or metabolize in your gut after bacteria ate them, and the bacteria will produce short-chain fatty acids that humans need. So my microbes have two choices in terms of max. The food that we eat are fiber and plants, the prebiotics, or the mucus, that is the protective layer of your gut lining. Some microbes prefer mucus. And if you have many of those mucus-preferring bacteria, they will eat away your gut lining, producing the condition leaky gut. So feeding the bacteria that prefers plants and fiber will keep the number of mucus-eating bacteria at bay. So principles of microbiota-focused diet. You need to eat more max, the food we eat that microbes can eat, fiber and plants. They're prebiotics. We need to consume meat in limited quantities. We need to limit saturated fat, animal fat intake. And we need to consume foods that are rich in bacteria, probiotics, the fermented foods. 
and we also need to reduce stress. Microbiome friendly diets like Mediterranean diet or paleo will produce a high diversity of microbiome. The Western diet or, the, or any diet that is lacking fruits and vegetables that are fresh and fermented foods will produce a low diversity of microbiome in your gut. So overall, eat food, not too much, mostly plants, and this will produce a healthy microbiome. Thank you for listening to this podcast. If you enjoyed today's episode, the best thing you can do is to share with someone and leave a review and rating. This helps me support more people just like you move toward better life with fibromyalgia. All you have to do is to go to the platform you're listening on, click the share button or the icon, and just send it to a friend. I so appreciate you taking your time to do so. Make sure you sign up or subscribe to this podcast so you can get the most up-to-date information in the new episodes. Thanks for joining me today, and I will see you next week. And don't forget to mind your fibro. Disclaimer, this podcast provides information only and does not provide any medical or psychological services or advice. None of the content on this podcast prevents, cures, or treats any medical or mental condition.